The turn of the 20th century was a wonderful age for invention. Steam and steam engines had been well established at this point, and the world was turning to a new and more shocking technology, electricity. In the Edwardian period, electric products were the next newest and in thing, and the railways were no exception. Electric railways, even in the 1900s, were nothing new, but there was still a lot to learn from electrifying the lines. In the north in Newcastle, the lines north of the Tyne were already electrified and were in service to passengers, but the line along the quayside wasn't. It was a small branch line, only about a mile long, but due to its turns and its free tunnels, it was difficult to traverse for steam crews. The tunnels were poorly ventilated, and the crews were at risk of choking and also of blowbacks. The sidings were also at risk from chimney sparks, and fires to goods were a common occurrence. After studying the tracks and the solutions, the North Eastern Railway's chief mechanical engineer, Wilson Wordsill, decided that the only option viable was to electrify the line. Due to the steep gradients, there was also a set of specifications that the new electric engines must have. Firstly, they must be able to start a train 150 tonnes on the steepest gradient, and they were expected to haul up to 300 long tonnes at an average speed of 14 miles an hour. Finally, they must be able to complete the journey end-to-end -end in under five minutes. To help with the extra requirements the engine needed to overcome, the North Eastern Railway looked overseas for the inspiration for the engines. In 1894, the US Railroad's firm General Electric had produced a new type of electric engine, the steeple cab. The steeple cab had a central driving area with a sloping hood at either end, ideal for housing equipment such as the noisy air compressor and the engines. The whole assembly is supported on two bogies, which could be powered by either a third rail, a pantograph or a bow collector, either attached to the roof or one of the cabs, or both together. In 1902, Wurzel signed off two new engines and charged the Thompson Houston Electric Company with the construction. They had built steeple cab engines before for Italy and their success had proved themselves capable for the task. They subcontracted brush engineering for the frames and the bodies and they themselves provided the engines. The engines were made in a bow bow arrangement. In a nutshell, when an engine, usually electrical or diesel, is described as this, it usually means that they have four axles in two individual bogies. Early electric and diesel locomotives were very similar to steam locomotives in their wheel arrangement with side rods, but the longer arrangement increased the weight and cornering stability. By having individual powered axles, this allowed for higher cornering speeds and allowed for better adhesion by allowing the bogies to be independent and not connected via a frame. No additional leading or trailing wheels were needed. Other variants include co co with six wheel bogies instead of four, one co co one which has an additional non-powered axle attached to the bogies for stability and weight dispersal, and co bo which is a mix of three and two axle bogies. Engines 1 and 2 were completed and were both operational by 1905. Both engines were driven by four 640 horsepower engines and were powered by 600 volts. The line was powered mostly by the pantograph, but in areas where height of the line was limited, the power was provided by a third rail. The engines were fitted originally with bow collectors, but they were replaced with pantographs in 1908 and the connecting shoes that connected the engine to the third rail were moved to the centre of the axles, so to accommodate for new sanding gear. The line incorporated both steam and the new engines, and a small steam shunter would work the lower yard, while the engine would be lowered down the incline using the ES1, and then lifted up by the same engine at the end of the day. To get to the goods to the dock side, the way the line worked was unusual to say the least. Rather than waste energy, the engine at the top of the incline stayed at the back, while a weighted brake van was put on the front. By disconnecting the engine at the top of the incline and using a well-placed guard, the whole train propelled itself down the hill thanks to gravity. It was much safer than having an engine in front, 
and it worked so well that the siding they used to run it on was suitably nicknamed the Runaway. The ES1 was always operated by two people, a driver and a second man. It was the second man's job to switch the power pickup, to uncouple and recouple trucks, and to act as a second pair of eyes, especially when shunting, and to act if things go wrong. All modern diesels and electric engines are fitted with a deadman. This is a lever or a pedal that must be pressed in order for the engine to move. The ES1s didn't have a dead man installed, so the second man would need to be on hand in case the driver fell ill or was injured and required to stop the engine. Although known today as the ES1, they didn't have a specific classification until after the Second World War and were commonly known as the Electrics class. They worked the quayside well into the 1960s where a diesel shunter took their place. In 1966, one of the engines, number two, was sold on for scrap after being withdrawn and put in storage in a car shed of all places. Number one ended up in rugby before it was sold to the National Collection, where it remains to this day. Number one is currently in the National Collection at Locomotion in Shildon and is the only reminder of what we have of that beautiful line. The years of construction of development have removed any traces of the railway and the tunnels were backfilled and now impossible to see under the tons of concrete that make the roads. While the railway is long gone, the only real reminder is the ES1, taking a rightful spot as a reminder of the history of the line in the National Collection. <laughs>